Welcome to Nursing with Professor Beams. In today's pharmacology video, I will be discussing beta blockers. This is a frequently tested medication in nursing school. Shout out to Vin Binky78. This person requested more pharmacology videos. So Vin Binky78, thank you for watching and this video is dedicated for you. All right, but before we go, make sure you hit the like button, make sure that you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell, please. It helps me so much. You cannot even imagine. It also helps me rank higher in the YouTube algorithm so other students like yourself that are struggling through nursing school right now can get cheat sheets. So please help them out too. Like the video, subscribe, turn on the notification bell make my videos rank higher so that other people can benefit from these videos and can pass nursing school. All right, let's go. Pharmacology, today we're going to be discussing beta blockers and you're going to see why I put LOL here soon. My farm tip for you, when you are remembering for exams or even in life for nursing, right? Um, if, you're, if you need to remember medications, you're new to nursing, all these medications are overwhelming, how are you going to remember all of them? What do you need to know? Oh my God, there's like 300 meds, what am I gonna do? Does it make more sense to remember 500 medications or does it make more sense to remember maybe 10, 10 classes of medications? Because when you're in nursing school, you need to know your classes. What I mean by classes is you need to know what's an ACE, what's an ARP, what's a beta blocker, what's a first generation antipsychotic, what's a second generation antipsychotic, what's an SSRI, what's an SNRI, right? So far, that's just seven and I'm covering a lot of, um, I've covered a lot, a wide umbrella. So it's easier to remember classes versus let me remember a list of 500 medications. Your brain does not work like that. Your brain works by chunking. So you gotta chunk things in little, little categories to help you remember medications. And the way you're going to remember beta blockers is because they end in LOL, okay? LOL or LOL, for me, I like saying LOL and then I just think of my baby emoji laughing right so examples of beta blockers so examples of beta blockers you see there the lol beta blocker propranolol atenolol metoprolol right they all end in lol now usually most drug classes will follow this and there will be one or two exceptions i'll give an example most benzos and end in lamb or pam right um, but not all of them. For example, chlordiazepoxide, which is Librium, trade name, is also a benzodiazepine, but doesn't end in lamb or pam. I remember my benzos by pam had a lamb. Anyways, but this video is about beta blockers, so let's go. Okay, so what do we use beta blockers for? They're indicated as first line therapy. If someone has had a myocardial infarction, so <laughs> heart attack, right? Um, they often use this post MI, um, to prevent also future MIs. So why do we give beta blockers post MI? Well, it helps decrease the oxygen demand that the body needs because since it reduces the heart rate and the blood pressure, the heart has to work less hard. Um, it also helps relieve ischemic chest pain. It decreases the risk of ventricular fibrillation. After a myocardial infarction, tissue has died and the electrical impulses don't travel as well through dead tissue. So by reducing the risk of VFib, you also, or arrhythmias, you also reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. So just basically the heart stopping. Cardiac arrest is the heart just stops because the electrical, you had a, a fatal rhythm. The electrical system in the heart just went haywire and all of a sudden there's a short circuit essentially. Beta blockers also help with angina or angina, I say angina, people say things differently. Um, angina is basically chest pain, helps with the prevention of it. And, it. and again, because it's decreasing the O2 demand. Arrhythmias, helps with arrhythmias, it helps with migraine prophylaxis, helps with hypertension, but definitely not first line for hypertension. When you're being tested on this in nursing school though, you're most likely going to see it be used. They're gonna say it's an antihypertensive. If you're in a, a strictly undergraduate nursing program. Um, it helps also with glaucoma, essential tremors. You learn about the other things in NP school, like for example, the migraine prophylaxis, the fact that it helps with essential tremors. Uh, when you're in nursing school, again, I wanna reiterate, you're most likely to see it for hypertension and maybe post-MI. So I don't want you to get too bogged down in all these details. 
and then as adjunct treatment for hypothyroidism. So think about it, hyperthyroidism, your thyroid is working too high, so you're jittery, your, your heart rate is going really fast. So this is symptomatic treatment in that. You give them a beta blocker, it slows their heart rate down, it slows their body down so that their heart rate is beating less fast. Anytime your heart is racing, automatically, that just does, that just makes your entire nervous system feel activated like they are nervous in themselves so what do beta blockers do you have beta 1 and beta 2 receptors and beta blockers are beta blockers blocks beta 1 and or beta 2 adrenergic receptor sites you don't really need to know all of this for you what you really need to know is that you only have one heart right that's why i put you have basically cardio selective and non cardio selective beta blockers what does that mean think of the words selective cardio selective it's only selected for the heart so when you take a pill that's cardio selective it only affects theoretically right they say only but realistically it affects it it can affect other parts the, the beta 2 but anyways it mostly i will say that word when you take a beta 1 a, a cardio selective beta blocker Theoretically, it mostly affects the heart versus the lungs because the lungs and the heart and other parts of the body also have beta receptors. But we're going to focus, I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible for you. So beta blockers blocks beta 1 and or beta 2 adrenergic receptor sites. So what you see is that you see a decreased heart rate and blood pressure and suppression of arrhythmias and prevention of myocardial infarction. So the effects of beta blockers is it decreases your heart rate and your blood pressure. It mostly decreases your heart rate though, not your blood pressure as much. And that's why this is not first light treatment for blood pressure because of its side effects and because it's not super effective for blood pressure to begin with. Suppression of arrhythmias, and prevention of MI. Now, I don't remember in nursing school talking about one of these. I So the ones that are in pink are the more, the frequently tested on and also the more severe. Um, side effects, adverse effects of this. So especially if someone has chronic respiratory disease and they take a non-cardio selective, and they take a non-cardio selective beta blocker, they could potentially have bronchospasm. So their airways just spas and close and anytime your airway closed that's an emergency if you can't breathe right so serious adverse effects are bronchospasm obviously if this slows your heart rate it can cause bradycardia so too slow of a heart rate we actually went too far in the in, in lowering them which leads us to usually the most frequently tested on NCLEX question or nursing test question. I will hit on that in the next slide. Um, also, beta blockers should really not be used in someone that has depression or fatigue. It tends to exacerbate depression, to be perfectly honest with you. And then ED means erectile dysfunction. So it means men can't get an erection. You always want to assess, is it because you can't get it up or is it the desire, right? A lot of SSRIs, which are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for uh, depression, will decrease libido. So maybe the guy can still get an erection, but their desire. So we always wanna ask men like, is this a lack of desire or is this that you can't have an erection? Um, and with beta blockers, it causes erectile dysfunction. So maybe they still have a desire to have sex, but they are unable to have an erection. It also blunts the hypoglycemic response. That can be very dangerous. So if someone has diabetes, which how many times in the hospital do you have someone that has the trifecta, right? They have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and also um, diabetes, right? Type 2 diabetes. We see it all the time. Let's say that in the hospital you have someone that is on a beta blocker, has diabetes, has hyperlipidemia. They get a change in their insulin regimen, right? This person normally the saying for hypoglycemia is cold and clammy need some candy right a lot of times they just feel dizzy they feel off they kind of get a little like shaky when their sugar's low but when they're on a beta blocker they may feel fine because like we said it blunts it it kind of it's like when it's really bright outside and you put some sunglasses on and you can't tell how bright it is until you take off the glasses and you're like wow so they're not able to feel how low their sugar is when normally they would if it weren't for this 
beta blocker. So be careful with that. Always go by what your professor or your teacher says, right? When I was in nursing school, things are changing all the time. When I was in nursing school and I just recently checked um, the Davis drug guide, beta blockers are contraindicated in chronic lung disease such as asthma, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis. Why? Because of their potential to cause bronchoconstriction, right? There are new studies out there that are saying that the risk is so low for this that they can still get it, but that's real life, okay? So when the NCLEX is, is testing you, they take forever to catch up with the, the latest evidence. So as of right now, when you're being tested on the NCLEX, think of beta blockers you want to always watch out for potential bronchoconstriction right it's just like that video i did on lisinopril with that chronic cough they love to test lisinopril with that cough i don't know what it is they're just obsessed with that dry cough so um this is frequently tested on like beta blockers don't give it, it can cause bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction don't give an asthma right um also you shouldn't be giving this an uncompensated heart failure it can make it worse Obviously, if someone's if someone's heart rate is 30 and you give them a beta blocker, what do you think you're going to do to them? You're going to kill them. You're going to take their heart rate down to, you know, God knows what. So, and that's an exaggerated response, right? If someone's heart rate were 30, clearly something is seriously wrong. But um, even if they're in their 40s, right? If their heart rate is in their 40s, you don't give a beta blocker. You don't want to give beta blockers for heart block, second or third degree heart block. But again, most frequently tested on, you need to know about the chronic respiratory disease, the bronchospasm, the bronchoconstriction. The very, very last thing that they usually will test on in regards to beta blockers is that number one, you need to take an apical pulse prior to administering, and the apical pulse is on your left hand side. Your apical pulse is on your left hand side. You want to feel the sternal notch and then um, the angle of Louis, and then your second intercostal space and you go all the way down, here's your clavicle, mid-clavicular line, down to the fifth intercostal space. So the apical pulse is at the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line. That is also frequently, frequently, frequently tested on, especially when you're in foundations, your first semester of nursing. So anyways, your apical pulse, fifth ICS at the mid-clavicular line. You wanna take that for one minute prior to administering any beta blocker. You're supposed to listen for a full minute. You're not supposed to listen for 15 seconds and then multiply it. Now, when I was in nursing school, go by what your teachers are telling you. Ask for clarification. Ask for clarification on exams. When I was in nursing school, if the heart rate was 60, we were supposed to hold a medication and notify the healthcare provider. So ask your teachers, for beta blockers, do we hold if the heart rate is at 60 or are we holding for 50, right? In nursing, in real life, on the MAR, usually there will be parameters. It'll say like, hold if heart rate less than 60 or hold if heart rate less than 50. So right now I checked the latest version of the Davis Drug Guide and they want you to take the apical pulse for one minute prior to administering. And if the heart rate is 50 beats per minute or if an arrhythmia is occurring, you withhold the medication and you notify the healthcare provider. In a nutshell, those are the most frequently tested on items for beta blockers and that's why i put the little pictures there to help you remember that beta one is cardioselective beta two you have two lungs so it affects the lungs beta two affects the heart and lungs all right um but mostly tested on you withhold that medication if the heart rate is 50 beats per minute or less you need to take an apical pulse for a full minute you do need to know where the apical pulse is all right Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe out there. You do need to know where the heck the apical pulse is. Ugh. Eh. Say that five times.